and welcome to the Penny Lane Podcast with Givy. It was so nice to sit down with another female trader, and Givy and I became fast friends. She has a wonderful story. I know you guys are going to love it. If you guys could please take the time to leave us a review on iTunes, give us a five-star rating, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you would really be helping us. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Pennies Going In Raw. The stock market is hotter than ever right now, and traders are taking advantage. But what does that mean for the people who still haven't started trading? The market can be a little intimidating at first, but you don't have to be alone in the learning experience. We at the Pennies Going In Raw podcast are here to help you. I'm Dan, and with my co-host, Hugh Henney, we make the stock market a fun but informative experience for our listeners. We offer knowledge for all levels of traders, from beginners to those who do it full-time. On PGIR, we discuss up-to-date news about the stock market and interview other traders who all started out just like us and made it big. You'll hear from Hugh and other multi-millionaire traders, founders and CEOs of companies, FinTwit superstars, and even professional athletes. Have you ever thought about investing your hard-earned cash but don't know where to start? Do you have money just sitting in your savings account collecting dust? We were all there once too. Listen to Pennies Going In Raw on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Gibby, hi. Welcome to the Penny Lane Podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been wanting to do this for so long. I and know. I tried to do it like six months ago, and then I think I forgot to answer you in my DMs because... I think I literally think that day I had a meltdown over Twitter and I just said, screw Twitter. And then I just never got back to you. And then finally we reconnected and I'm so happy. Totally. Um, No worries at all. The DM game is it's like swimming upstream. And, you know, there's some (laughs) things that I can't or I'll be like, that requires a longer like thing. So I'll do that later. And you know what's frustrating Mm -hmm. about Twitter DMs is you can't flag. You know, like in yeah. your email. So I'm not an email flagger. Okay. Well, I I wish <laughs> if anyone who works at Twitter is listening, like if I could somehow flag or press like unread or something on my DMs, I think I could really handle it a lot better. But it's not an organized system. It's almost as bad as Discord. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, did you just recently start your own Discord? I did. I did about a couple, oh, I think like maybe three or four months ago now. Okay. It's been some time. It's been some time. And um, everybody's welcome, even if you don't like crypto. I mean, we also just talk about trading in general. I know some of the people do options in there. Um, but I, I did, yeah. It's it's a lot of fun. Givey Crypto Lounge. Cool. So um, I know you from Giraffe Club. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and um, I actually was going through my baseball hats the other day and have yours. So I was like, oh, yeah, I need to like wear that. <laughs> oh, I would have wrote you a special note. Oh, a special um, had I, note. Had I, known, had I known, well, some when I was doing the fundraiser for Gwen, I didn't know that some of the people ordering them, like, I don't know people's real identities. I mean, I totally do to some part now. Um, but at the time, I mean, Bull Shark ordered one, and Aww. I didn't know his identity until now. And I was like, I would have like drawn you a heart or something. Yeah, <laughs> just cute. a little. Well, but now that I know you ordered something, thank you. That oh, means a lot. You're so welcome. So welcome. I'm I'm a big um, giver backer, like especially in the communities that. I, so I'm in a lot of discords just to sort of like hang out and peruse, but then I'm like you're in welcome. yes. But then I'm like in some communities where I feel like I'm really, you know, a backbone. This is a self-given title, but I'm like, these people need me for, like, <laughs> you know, just humor and whatever. So in those communities, I always, I always like to give back. I like to call those people the self-titled mayors of the Discord channel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's I, okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So I was actually in um, Dr. Bull Shark's um, his Discord the other day, and he was on voice with Rodessa, and I just like said hi in the room because um, <laughs> usually I just like look at his tweets and we DM, but I don't often go in the Discord. So anyway, I was like, "Hey guys," and they were like, "Oh, you're like come on, come on voice," and 
I go on voice and they're like actively trading. And within two minutes, I was like, yeah, I'm just hanging out here in Atlanta. And somebody, <laughs> somebody was like, oh, isn't Atlanta known for casinos? And I was like, no, strip clubs. And you know, with this, <laughs> all the strip clubs are. And then someone on the floor was like, every Discord I'm in with her, she does this. Like she comes in and then we're talking about strip clubs too. And it's or like, whatever. It's just like, she's so disruptive. It. And I was like, I don't mind being known as that person. Like, <laughs> you and I have that in common. I'm in one where a couple of my good friends are in it and, and they trade all day long. And I, I don't, like, I'll be honest with you, I do not trade all day long. Um, that's why I like crypto because I can trade at nine o'clock at night yeah. and it's not during market hours. So I'll pop in to just like shoot the shit and like bring up something that doesn't make sense. And they'll give me maybe like a couple minutes of their time. And then eventually they're like, all right, give me like, you need to stop talking yeah or be productive and help the team i'm like all right sorry bye yeah yeah yeah. i'll make myself i'm gonna listen bye right same i'm not like confident enough to be giving my entries and exits and things of that nature but if there's like a good that's what she said opportunity then i'm there for that (laughs) yeah i mean that can be just as valuable as giving entries and exits we all need some humor i mean i think so too but like often it'll be like Please take this in the off-topic room. I don't want to hang out in the off-topic room. I want to hang out here on the floor. With the cool it's kids. Like put in detention. Yes. in there. Yep. Uh, oh, that's too funny. It really brings me a lot of pleasure. So, you know. just <laughs> Mental health is half the battle. So if it makes you feel good, then I think you should keep doing it. And if they tell you to leave, they can leave. Totally. Totally. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yes. I'm, I try to make myself lovable, though. So no one gets, like, that mad. You know? Um, I do. I, I used to be that way. Now I'm very polarizing. You either really like me or you really don't like me. Oh, interesting. And I just kind of come to terms with that's the type of person I am. There's not really like a middle ground. Interesting. I'm, I'm jealous that you've embraced this. What's your sign? I'm an Aries. I'm an angry, aggressive ram. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I can, I understand that. I'm a Libra. Oh, so so is my mom. I just want to be all things to all people. (laughs) She wants, everybody loves her. She's the nicest person. You guys are, (laughs) you're not people pleasers, but you're kind. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's true. I think that there. It's a difference. Yeah. It's sort of like, I'm not going to be a people pleaser, but I am going to be so kind to you that you will like. I don't know. I I value kindness a mm, lot. with kindness. Yeah. Yeah. I try that sometimes. It really depends on the situation. <laughs> like I I have a limited amount of kindness in my body. Uh-huh. I really do. And if somebody isn't deserving of it, I'm just, I'm not going to waste it. So interesting. I, I just don't have the capacity. I'm an introvert. So I always say that I have a- No way. Yeah. No, you're not. Yeah, totally. I am. The introvert has her own podcast. Yeah. Makes sense. Yes. I am extroverted online and introverted in life. Huh. I know. It's weird. Sometimes people think that I'm kind of just like bitchy and because they like, Mm -hmm. I I also have a big Instagram following and then I've got the podcast and I am just so outward on social media that I think sometimes people expect me to be that way in real life and then think that I'm kind of bitchy, but it's not. I just have you know, self-esteem issues or something. I don't know. Very interesting. Yeah. I will say this. When I met Happy in DC, towards the other night, he goes, you are literally everything I thought you would be, as in you talk like you tweet. And I was like, I am always myself. (laughs) Always. I love that. That's why I'm so polarizing. Um, I love Happy. We were talking about Happy before, but we weren't talking about him on the podcast. Just one one of my faves. So- yeah. So wise to be so I, I young. I my adopted little brother. I know. I know. Even though I have a real one, I'm not shaming him. He just doesn't trade. Yeah. So this is my like chosen adoptive younger brother. Totally. He I, knows that too. I also have a little brother who's an Aries, funny enough. And, um, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Happy's so lovable. I mean, my brother's mm-hmm. lovable too, but. <laughs> How old you, is he younger or older? He so I'm 38 and he is okay. 36. Nope, 35. Math is, is difficult your, for me. Is that your only sibling? 
I have two step siblings that are younger okay. than my brother. So, you know, oldest of two or four, however you, you know. I think that's why I kind of could get along with Happy so well is because my younger brother is seven years younger than me and we're the only two. Uh-huh. And Happy is, I think he's like nine years younger than me. So I was like, oh, you're just as equally a child. Like I know how to relate to you. Uh, my stepsister, who is married to Justin, who's my co-host, um, is exactly 10 years younger than me. And I like got her as a sister when she was six. And she is just like one of the loves of my life. Like, I just Aww. love the age gap. And I always feel kind of it's like motherly, but also she's very mature. So a lot of times she teaches me things, but it's a 10 years is a pretty fun age gap. Is something that's for sure. It's it's a lot easier now that we're older. But when I was eighteen and you know he was ten and wanted to hang out with me, there was there was no way. Like he wasn't coming. <laughs> and now it's now it's reversed. I'll be like, hey, can I like come out with you and your friends? And he's like, I'm not your babysitter. Like, oh, <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Sorry. Do, do you guys live in the same town? Um. Well, we kind of. I don't know why this is not working in my brain. We both recently moved home. So he's in grad school and I was living in Philly. And then when the pandemic hit, I, cause I was living by myself. I didn't want to be in, you know, solitary confinement during the pandemic. Yeah. So we moved, I moved home and he kind of did the same thing. Um, but the difference is I just like, didn't leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm actually moving out in two weeks. So by the time this airs, I will have already <laughs> left, but he, um, because he's in like university city in Philly and it's not always the best area. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he recently just sold his apartment. So now he's back home. So we are both currently under one roof. Um, I sort of is, love this. I love it too, but I loved it more six months ago. Yeah. Who cooks in ready. your family? I'm, oh, I'm so spoiled. My mom. Oh my gosh. Oh my. And, or, or my brother cooks. I, or like even when I'm at my girlfriend's house, she cooks. Like I am not the cook. I would so much rather clean up than cook. Oh, you're so spoiled. You're so my husband just doesn't cook and then claims that he like literally cannot. So but but he really likes being cooked for. So he's always like, Well, I mean, I'll do the dishes. I'm like, oh it's not yep. it's not yeah. the same. <laughs> but I know it's not, but like I wouldn't you rather cook something delicious than eat a meal by somebody that can't cook and it'd be like bland and like, eh. Yeah. Yeah. I can do breakfast. Breakfast. I can do fantastically. Okay. Okay. Everything else. No, no go. Well, at least you have something to offer. That's great. Especially if, yeah. you know, <laughs> useless. if you're hungover and someone offers to cook you breakfast, cool. that is a nice gift. So that's when you walk to Wawa and you get a breakfast sandwich. Sure, sure. We have do you have Wawa? No, but we do have Waffle House. <gasps> yeah. Oh, yeah. I all right, so in college we had a Waffle House on campus. Uh I mean it was open 24-7. Yeah, of course. Yep. The hash browns are delicious. The hash browns, you gotta get them a little extra crispy though. That like mm-hmm. that's really key. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The 3 a.m. crew made it the best. I will say that their 3 a.m. crew is a lot more lively than their any other time of the day. Crew. It's very odd to be in a Waffle House and not be at the end of a partying situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if. And yes, we, I under, it's very strange to go there just to go there. Yes. Yes. And things stick out to you that don't uh, at the end of a night. Like, you know, maybe maybe the there's a little bit more oil on the plate than you would prefer or like the you know maybe the the (laughs) seat is slightly sticky but at 3 a.m those things don't don't matter (laughs) oh my god that's so yeah i've seen oh i've seen some characters in waffle house i went to college in lancaster pennsylvania oh fantastic people don't know is actually it's not all amish it's actually pretty dangerous the downtown area is um it's quite filled with gangs okay there are like five to ten major gangs there and i actually did a tour of the local prison in undergrad and it's just 
like it's all gang members. So when you go to these places at 3 a.m., you you expect to see like an Amish person? Absolutely not. It's very seedy. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I went to college in Athens, Georgia, and it is uh, very different. Very different. You <laughs> you're just surrounded by other other students, and <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. very much a college town. I want to ask you where you went to school, but I will. We'll do that off the pod. Oh, everyone knows I went to the University of Georgia. I've been very oh. open about my. Uh, I mean, we won the national championship, I, so I've got a lot of Georgia pride right now. I um, I mean, I went to law school at Villanova, and as you know, we've won oh, a few basketball championships. Yes, yes. You know? So I un- I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I I went to, I actually transferred. So I first went to Boston University and then transferred to Georgia. I'm from Georgia. So I I would say that is quite yeah, a difference. Yeah. No, I came home. I like thought that I wanted to be very, uh, I just thought that I wanted to live in Boston. And then I got up to Boston. It wasn't, it just wasn't like home. Not the South. Yeah. It's not the South. It's not the South at all. And I didn't think I loved the South until I got up there and I you know, I I was very thankful to get home and feel like I was at home. Yeah. Not that oh, I don't that's really love cool. Boston, like as a city and it's gorgeous. There's so many things to love. I just like. You can love a city without wanting to live there. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. So were you in, were you in Greek life at Georgia? No, I, that's not for me. You know, I'm introverted. <laughs> just, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. very fair. Not for me. <laughs> okay. Very fair. But my brother, speaking of my brother, was um, he was the president of his fraternity and he was there. So I took five years as people do at Georgia. So the last Mm -hmm. two years I was there, he was in a fraternity, one of them, and then he was the president, one of them. And I really enjoyed all those perks. Like I had a parking pass Mm -hmm. at the fraternity. I got to go to any party I wanted. It was like that was all cool. I envy you. My college was actually smaller than my high school. Oh, that's nice, though. No, no, it is not. Okay, you know, okay. <laughs> no, okay. It's it's like Mean Girls. It's like Mean Girls. Like everybody knows everything about everyone. There were, I went to, so have you ever heard of Franklin and Marshall? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really small. There's like 2,400 people there, or some small amount of people. And it's just, I mean, when you went to, you could probably go to a party and any random party and not know maybe no one or two people there yeah yes yeah that would never happen we would i would know everybody there even if for by some sort of association like you just know everybody there there's no it's just very small so i went to a very small private high school and really like in retrospect i really was like thrived in that environment and then Mm -hmm. got up to Boston and literally nobody knew me except my roommate who went to the same high school with me. And I found it very difficult to, to find my place after coming from, I also, it was a alpha omega situation. And then Mm -hmm. to go into Boston and try to be like, I went there uh, to major in photojournalism. I've always been an artist. It's like a, my my huge passion it's your calling yeah so I went there trying to be like I'm this like artsy chick from the south and and people were like I do not care like you are not special to me and I was like oh oh okay okay Okay. and then going back to Georgia had so many yes yes uh going back to Georgia had so many people from my high school and so yes I could go into a party where I didn't know anyone, but then could also would hang out with my crew. So I'd always know 10 people, which was a night. It mm-hmm. was, it was big and small. Yeah. I, I envy that. Yeah. But to each their own. Totally. Okay. So Gibby, how did you um, transition from law school into trading? Um, I, it was out of boredom in COVID. Okay. Honestly. Same, same seas. <laughs> I had, I had never really even considered trading stocks, or it had never entered my brain until 
I was home um, and one of my mom's friends came over and she said she made a lot of money by buying, I think, Zoom stock before everything went nuts. And I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. That's probably so easy. I can do yep. that. Yeah. I, mean, I was like <laughs> addicted. <laughs> did you start on Robin Hood? No, no, I did okay. not. I went, um, no, I, I called my bank and I said, hi, how do I invest in stocks? And they like sent me their <laughs> app. And then I, it just turned into me eventually going to think or swim. Um, I never used Robin Hood ever. Good for you. I feel like you. literally every person on the podcast started on, and I always, I'm like, do you start on Robin Hood? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can proudly say that I, I don't have that attached to my name. No Robin Perfect. Hood here. Perfect. Sorry, so um, I won't support you. <laughs> so you um you got on Thinkorswim, and then did you have any hurdle in learning to use the platform? Yes. Okay. I was very, I was very confused for about a week. Oh wow, that's a that is not much of a learning curve, and I'm very impressed. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. it, it took me, well, for, I opened it and then was just like, I can't do this. And then shut it down and traded on my phone for, I mean, like a year. And was just like, that's not something I'm capable of doing. And then in yeah. order to learn it, I quit drinking. Oh, Because okay. I, I was like, my, like I, my brain, I'm old now. I'm almost 40. I'm like, my brain's not nimble enough to You're learn how old. to do this. So I quit drinking for like six months, but wow. now I'm, now I'm a badass at think or swim. So, you know, I, I do <laughs> miss it, but now I use trading view and okay. I, I, I will never go back to anything. It is well worth the money. This is not a paid sponsor. I literally pay them like hundreds of dollars a year to use it. <laughs> and I, I don't regret it. I love it so much. Do you link it through your think or swim? I don't use think or swim because I only do crypto now oh uh wait only mm -hmm. oh wait so what mm, okay well trading view i'm interested i'm interested in that um but i'm more interested on how you went from let me buy a stock to i only trade crypto it's very standard Gibby has very bad adhd okay um, it turned into let me buy a stock and then i got pretty much addicted to it and in the first two weeks made about 50 grand. Like Holy I just, crap. I, yeah. And then I lost about a hundred grand in oh. the next two weeks wow. because I'm wow. very, yeah, I'm very much wow. zero to a hundred with everything, including. So, uh, we're, uh, I mean, I at a loss for yeah, words. You don't, there's not, there's, I don't tell a lot of people <laughs> this story. I think I posted a thread about it before. Um, I have since then, that was a year ago, in that time frame, I'm up, I'm up a decent chunk. So I, okay. I really, I really sat down and I was just like, listen, you just lost more money than you knew. It was because I, I immediately went over PDT. Yep. Um, thinking that I was like, okay, well, if I just have a little bit more money, like I'll be able to make badass trades. And like, that was all well and good and it worked. But then I was like, okay, you're like really doing well. And then I would just make a stupid trade that would knock it all out times four. And then I would revenge trade. And then I was just like, you can't multitask while you're at work. So then I started waking up really early and only trading pre-market and the open. And then I would, and then I would do my real job, which uh -huh. I mean, wasn't the most productive sure. um, <laughs> at all. But, and then in that year span, I got myself back to net even. And then over the last, I think nine months, I'm, I'm up, I'm up um a, a, a decent chunk okay so i i have really gone from one extreme to the other i i like can't imagine the emotion involved in being up that much and it then down that much concerning to me that there was none oh wow i was like i'm it's very bizarre in in the real world i'm very empathetic I'm what you would call an emotional sponge like I can't watch things on tv because like my heart will just hurt for other people that I just can't help so when all of this was going on and I'm watching myself lose money and having absolutely no reaction it's 
terrifying because it's I like, mean, that's sociopathic. Right. You could be a serial killer. I'm not. Trust me, I'm not. I would, I would be so <laughs> sad. I, I couldn't do it. I actually had to leave my last job because I couldn't handle the emotional toll it was taking on me. Okay, so, so I didn't mean, I didn't really mean you could be a serial oh, no, killer. I know, but like somebody will hear that and take it. <laughs> yeah, right. So let's just get that out there. Right. I'm we not. can actually cut that out if you want to. No, it's okay. You can leave okay. it. It's fine. Okay. Um, no, you can leave it. But, it, and I'm still kind of that way. Um, and I think it's because even though I had lost a lot at one point in my head, I knew that if I just stopped being stupid and making impulsive revenge trades, I'm good at it. Like, I, I know that in my brain, which is why I never really freaked out because I knew that I would get it back if I actually applied myself. Uh huh. So I think that's why I never went into full blown panic mode, even though I, I absolutely should have. Okay. So in the last sentence, you said, um, because I'm good at it. What a freaking powerful thing to say. I didn't mean to sound like a jerk. No, no, no. I do not think you sounded like a jerk. And that's such a vein going through this podcast, actually. Um, I have interviewed Shark a couple of times, but the first time I interviewed him, I talked to him about when I, um, there was a light switch moment in my life when Mm -hmm. I was able, like, I spent 20 years saying, I want to be an artist. Like, Mm -hmm. I want to be an artist. And then about five years ago, there was a moment where I said, I am Yep. An artist. And then by being able to say I am an artist, I I can now say like I'm a I'm a good artist. And, you know, there had to be certain sort of milestones that hit or whatever. But now it is such. Yes. It's such a confidence of mine that Mm -hmm. like I just released this whole thing of NFTs that look like a five year old drew them. And I have like no qualms with releasing them because i'm like this is i have i have you know collectors and i have like this is who i am and so the fact that you like so quickly were able to say i am good at this i'm very impressed and like what a gift thank you it's um it's like the whole fake it till you make it thing you know yeah and then eventually you just make it um yeah I'm one of those people where I don't like to do something unless I can do it really well. Totally. um, Same. And I also refuse to let inanimate objects beat me. So I, at the time was like, think or swim, like you will not beat me, even though it wasn't think or swim. But at the time I was in my head, it was this dumb video game and these stupid candlesticks and think or swim and TD bank were not going to beat me an actual human with a brain. I, I, I love the competitiveness. I love my, awful. yeah, I love it. No, I think it's you, fantastic. Are you a fan of friends? Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Okay. I am Monica Geller. When oh, okay. When it comes competition. Everything okay. is a competition. Okay. It's a blessing and a curse. I, uh, relate to that, but I don't. I think I am more in a competition of myself, like every single day being like, I will be better than I was yesterday. But that, but not necessarily like against other people as much. Yeah, I get that. I I had to make it against somebody else. I like that though. Mm -hmm. That's the motivation. Oh, I'm so like in awe of your power of like- Thank you, but don't. No, but like owning that you- directed. Okay, well, I, it's not something Actually, that I have, and I no, think that's it's not true. great. It's it's um, it's why I also some people ask me all the time why I don't just full time trade, and it's because I genuinely like being an attorney, and being an attorney to me it's it's like a sport. Mm-hmm. Like going to trial is a sport. All of the rules of evidence, and you know what can be admitted, and what's hearsay, like it's no different than a football play. There's tactics, there's strategies. It's legitimately just a sport. And I think it's fun. Yeah. Did I tell you my brother who's an Aries is also a lawyer? Did I already mention that? I just feel like him and I should be friends. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you guys would like each other. <laughs> really like each other or really not like each other. Right. It could go one of two ways, but I think I think that you guys would really get along. What kind of law does he practice? So he um did tax law for Oof. a while. That's and hard. then it is hard. It is hard. That's really um hard. yeah. But so my mother owns a real estate company here in Atlanta, like a a really nice, Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a badass and like made this company and that's great. And my brother now works for her and like helps her with the negotiating those contracts. And Mm -hmm. it's so he gets to kind of like scratch that itch, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Good for him. That's, That's hard. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard. That is actually the only class in law school I was in for two days and said, I'm out. And I immediately withdrew. I couldn't do it. You know, if you're a lawyer, you can get a real estate license like easily. Or I mean, you, you, I think can just take the test. You don't have to do all the paperwork and. It was tax law that I dropped out of. Oh, okay. Okay. It was just not for me. Those people have special brains. I, I just don't for that. Yeah. God bless um, <laughs> do you listen to any true crime podcast? All of them. Okay, well, great. I try, I try to. <laughs> I get <sighs> unpopular opinion. I don't like crime junkies. Oh, nor do I. Nor I do just, I. I, I. I don't like the true crime podcasts where you just hear a narrator. I like to hear victims, suspects, testimony. Yes. Like it has yes. to be an actual... I don't want to just hear somebody talk at me, even though they're very good. Okay, so was Serial life-changing for you? Um, I really enjoyed it. I don't think it was life-changing. I, I enjoyed S-Town better. Okay. Well, I, there was the scene in Serial where they're, like, in the car, like, tracking exactly how long it took to get from that one place cool. to another. So cool. That was Like, really if, cool. if I could live my life, like, trying to. It was to, so cool. It was so and, like, cool. Timing it if he could have gotten from the school to, like, the Yes. Wall. Yeah, it was very cool. Yeah, so cool. So cool. That was, that was uh, a good one. I, I liked that one because a lot. I, I like the ones where you do hear a lot of, things about legal testimony and and courtrooms because it doesn't make me angry whereas like how sometimes courtrooms and you know even legal procedures are on are are just portrayed on tv shows is just so false Mm -hmm. that it's just like i can't watch this whereas like the podcasts actually don't make me feel that way and they can keep my interest now, have you ever had a dream of like freeing an innocent person or anything via podcast? <laughs> via podcast? Um, yeah. <laughs> not via podcast, via real life though. I've okay. tried to um my I've tried to Okay, let me back up. Um I tried my first job, well, I clerked for a judge and then I met a, an attorney when I was clerking and the firm that I was at for the last two, three years, um, I wanted to help people and it wasn't over podcasts, but it was over real life because mm-hmm. I'm an empath. I, I want to help people. And I have a very, I don't know why, um, I don't have any, you know, mentally or physically handicapped family members or friends. Um, I have a very big soft spot for the handicapped and for mm-hmm. sick kids. And elderly, those three. Um, I know everybody does to some extent, but like mine is like, I don't know. It's just a weird heart connection. I know how crazy that sounds. But I ended up working for a firm that specialized in representing families who were the victims of traumatic, who were the victims of going through a traumatic birth. So their child was born either mentally or physically handicapped solely because a doctor messed up. Oh, wow. Otherwise, their child would have been born functioning as a healthy individual. And I went through law school specializing in intellectual property. So how I got there, it's just unknown. <laughs> but it was it was very out of what I saw myself doing. But I just, I met some um, somebody when I was clerking that I watched these attorneys help. And she had, I, I watched them settle a case and and the way the parents lit up when they were told, you know, they were given $3 million 
which sounds all well and great, but when you're taking care of somebody that's that handicapped, that's only going to last like two or three years with full-time care. And they were just so gracious and so elated that I said, I really want to do that. And so I did, but I couldn't handle it mentally. Like some people can become desensitized to it. And I would just cry. Like after every intake call or hearing what these families were going through, I would just sob. And I could never get used to thinking, well, they were going to be hurt whether or not I talked to them. Like, I'm just here to help that I couldn't get past it. So that's ultimately was part of the driving decision of me leaving and like kind of starting my own law firm. So I I have want, thought about trying to help somebody innocent or just, you know, that was a victim of somebody else in real life. Just a long answer to no. I've never thought about it over a podcast. <laughs> Interesting. I was a juror once for a medical malpractice case, and the woman Mm -hmm. ended up with no legs. And it was so difficult to listen to all the it. The trial went on for like maybe ten days. It was a long thing. That's it. And yeah, and I've actually been a juror twice. One was a a domestic abuse case, and then the other one was this medical malpractice one. And I had a panic attack like during Mm -hmm. the thing. I like could not breathe because I was just like, I can't like handle it. And the judge had to um, like call a recess because I was having a panic attack. Oh, no, you were that juror. (laughs) Yeah, I was that person. I was that Uh, person. (laughs) The longest trial I've ever been in when I was a clerk, the judge I was with, we had one and it was an eight week long medical malpractice trial. It was I, I can't do that. And and it's just, it's it's so taxing on the jurors, on the people, because they have to relive everything. And it's just, it's awful. It's awful. But somebody has to do it. Yep. <laughs> but yep. it's no longer me. So, um, yeah, I, I think that maybe one day in another life, I will try and free somebody over a podcast. Maybe that can be our next project. Okay. I've always wanted to work for the Innocence Project. Okay. I, very interested in the whole thing. I mean, I like got real deep into true crime podcasts for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, actually, honestly, I wanted to do a true crime podcast myself, um, but just couldn't find a case that I was like, thought that I could make a difference in. And then tra- I got really into trading during COVID and was like, oh, I could talk about this for hours like oh, yeah. I, th- this is my podcast but yeah anyway. I, th- I mean I think you're doing a great job so no problems oh. here oh well, thanks so talk to me about um your new law venture yes so when I was in law school um have you ever heard of people wanting to be on law review or write on a journal those types yeah, of things of course yeah they're very prestigious things and everybody was like I want to write on a journal I want to be on law review and there's usually law schools have three journals you have law review which is like the cream of the crop and then you have two other ones that are also really great to be on they're just not law review well to get on these things you have to write very long papers and then submit them and then everybody you know reviews them and whatever and it's like Everybody tries to get on them and only, I think, like maybe 20% actually make it. Uh So I, when I was doing that, I realized as I was writing about something, I was like, this is awful. I don't want to do this. I know it looks great, but this is, this is terrible. So I ended up emailing a website called The Fashion Law, which focused on intellectual property disputes and human rights violations in the fashion industry, which is booming. If you ever want to, I can talk your ear off about (laughs) any of that stuff. And fast fashion is like such that you will watch me get so heated over fast fashion. So if you ever want to do a podcast on that, hit me up. But oh man, I wrote to her and I said, Hey, I'm a, I'm a one L, you know, we're doing our journal submissions. I don't want to, I don't want to write for a journal. Um, can I write for you? And she's like, I've never had an intern before, but like, Sure, we'll figure it out. And then I ended up becoming an associate editor of her website. And I was on it for three years. Uh, The only reason I left was because I was clerking for a judge and it was a conflict of interest because you're not allowed to do anything when you work for the courthouse. Um, So I just, from that point on, I really loved IP. I'm fascinated by it and just how all of this works. So when I was you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, 
in the last six months, I, it didn't make sense for me to do anything other than start my own IP firm. And I say that knowing it sounds ridiculous, but I, I grew up watching my parents start a small business. Um, they, I'm very fortunate in how successful they were. Obviously that's helped me and impacted my life. And I don't take that for granted at all, but I grew up watching my mom and my dad build something from the ground up. So yep. to me, I was like, I want to do that. Yep. Yep. So here we be. Oh, I love it. And I, I love it. Thank you. And I mean, I never thought that I would become so interested in trading and then be able to merge the two, which is ultimately what I'm trying to do. Um, I think we're at a very pivotal moment in legal regulations and kind of our government catching up with what is blockchain, cryptocurrencies, NFT, Web3, like all these things. And I, I want to be a part of that. They're going to be regulated at some point. There are going to be legislations and statutes. And this is what I'm interested in. So why can't I make myself, you know, a key figure in that area? Totally. There's no reason I can't. I mean, I know that big law firms already have people doing it, but I don't see any of them as involved in retail trading as I am. Yeah. So it opens up a totally different avenue. I interviewed Dan Knight from Pennies Going and Raw, and I, we were talking about, um, I think I said, like, one day there will be, like, looking back, a huge story written about what happened in 2020 and the rise 100%. of the retail trader. And this is going to be something that people talk about. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're you're going to be a pivotal figure in that. And he said that he had the wherewithal to know. He was like, I knew it was big and I knew I wanted to be a part of it. And that yeah. is why I started the podcast. And I was yeah. just like, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. We have that in common. That's why I want to be the go-to person when somebody's like, I just got rug pulled. Like, I want to sue somebody. I want them to come to me. Or I want to be the attorney that a group of developers that wants to start an NFT and do it the right way and follow all the regulations and, you know, possibly organize it as a corporation or write bylaws, something like that. I want to be the person they go to. Like we're in such this, this cool moment that I don't think happens very often. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, now's the time to really go out on a limb and try and take advantage of it. As opposed to like, if I was, you know, 45, 50 years old with kids and, had more people depending upon me than right now. Like now's the yep. time to try and do that. And if I fail, I fail. I tried. Yeah. I, I I'm not going to, but <laughs> I love you. I mean, you have to manifest is... it. You have to manifest it. <laughs> oh, I totally, to. I totally believe in that. And I also am a child of two incredible entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And you know how it I, feels. I know how it feels in my husband often, if I have a bad day at trading or I do, you know, if I'm just feeling like a little down about sort of the way things are going, he's like, well, why don't you go get a job for, you know, a company that you really like? And I'm why like, you hell get a job for a company you really no, like, <laughs> like no. I refuse to, yeah. to let somebody like, I, I am going to own the company. Like that mm -hmm. is what exactly. is going to happen. Exactly. And it feels really cool. It feels yeah. really damn cool. Really, really cool. I feel like that so much about this podcast. Like this is, I, so, it's yours. It's my mm -hmm. thing. And it just like reeks of like what I wanted it to be. And it, it like, and it is exactly. just putting it like blood, sweat and tears. I literally willed this into being <laughs> and that's how I feel I I know it's only been about I think I started in November is when I incorporated my law firm but it's it's everything that the firms I was working at weren't there's no wasted overhead a lot of what I'm doing is charging for fl I'm charging flat fees because I think a lot of people are deterred from attorneys because you know every email costs them 50 bucks well, I don't want a client to not communicate with me because they don't want to spend the money. That doesn't do anybody any good. So I'm trying to really take these things that I think are wrong with the legal field and just get rid of them. 
Mm -hmm. There's no reason that the legal field is literally one of the only professions where people are paid hourly. Can you imagine if a surgeon was being paid hourly? Yeah, no. I need, okay, what if I need like life dependent heart surgery that's going to cost, that's going to take five hours and, you know, this world class surgeon is making $2,000 an hour. Like people would never go to surgery. So why is the legal field any different? It should God, be. You're reimagining both the like legal service thing. It's either really going to well, work or I mean, really going to fail. <laughs> why would you ever want to live any any different kind of way? Like I wouldn't. Yeah. I would get too bored. I mean, I, I really picked the wrong profession I, to not be able to sit yeah, down from Yeah, I mean, the, like, and that's how I felt during this podcast. Like, I'm literally a nobody. I'm a woman. I don't know how to trade. I'm either going to, mm-hmm. like, there's a 5% chance of succeeding. And I was like, cool. I'm doing this thing where I'm, like, posting my trades and my charts and stuff. And it's painful because I've been it. going through such a hard time. And I, like, all of that. I don't love doing all of that. It doesn't feel good to me. And but someone, it makes, it's good though. You're transparent, and it's 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 a sort of realness that is very few and far between. I've uh, the followers are such a weird thing, and I'm it's so weird. I'm spoiled because I have a really big Instagram following. And thought, like, I know how hard I work to get that Instagram following, but somehow, like, forgot it, like, childbirth forgot it, and was like, oh, I'm just going to go over to Twitter and use the same whatever, and I'm going to have, like, I'll easily be able to grow that audience. So, Mm -hmm. and it's not working. Like, I don't, I don't have a big following on Twitter, yet I have, like, a fervent podcast base. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how is this working out that like that? I, I want to give you uh, advice, but I have no idea why 10,000 people follow me. I don't. I'm flattered. I just I don't know what I did to get that number. So I can't. I can't. Help. <laughs> I, I, I really can't. And I think that's really cool about Instagram. I actually don't even have an Instagram. So Instagram is is now uh, it's much harder than for me than Twitter. But but. Honestly, that's because like I'm just so in this the trading world that I'm just constantly thinking of like things to say or things to tweet or whatever. Where Instagram and that's why, exactly that's why we're on Twitter like, because it's it's words. You can't really put trading into pictures. Totally. I looked at how many um tweets I'd sent out the other day, and it's something like seventeen thousand tweets. And I'm like, what the hell have I had to say for seventeen thousand? <laughs> like, how does that happen? Yeah. I I get it. I deleted mine. I deleted mine right before the new year because I just, there were so many tweets that I have, you know, I've praised some traders over the last year and a half. And, you know, my views have drastically changed from then to now. And I just, I didn't feel right leaving them up there. So I just nuked the whole thing. And the amount of tweets I, I had deleted, it was just like, what do you, like, what did I say? Yeah. How do I have that many things to say? Yeah, totally. totally. It me. I mean, I get it back in my live tweeting days, I'd probably post like 300 different entries and exits a day. But like, that's exhausting. Yeah. I don't miss yeah. small caps. That, that makes me not miss small caps. Ooh, I've been back looking at small caps this week because it's the week, right? Mm-hmm. And I have like a it's a, it's an addiction for me. I haven't played any, but just looking at the charts, um, it gives me that same kind of like like it's a rush. Uh, it's a yeah. Ooh, I it's a rush. I I I do miss that sometimes. I'm gonna be honest. I I do miss that. I I distinctly remember being at my old job, sitting in my office with the door shut, um, not locked but shut. And my my two monitors up. I had Thinkorswim. I had like three charts on one side on one screen and then I had discord and twitter up on the other and it was like the biggest small cap day I've ever had I was caught in two halts I made Ah. in in 10 minutes I made listen to this one this will this is how I knew that I had an issue in 10 minutes I made 30 grand five minutes I lost 25 of it oh my god oh my god have you had your heart checked like I would be like in a hospital and then at the end of the day I walked away with five grand and I was like you know if you want to make that second trade like that's 30 grand right there but nope 
And that's ultimately why I left small caps because I just like couldn't not trade. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't want to deal with the mental health pains of, you know, trying to figure out the games behind the market makers, but I miss small caps. All that being said, I do miss them. Yeah. I have, um, so I told you I quit drinking to learn think or swim, but like, Obviously, if you need to quit drinking to like learn something, at, like I wasn't a casual drinker. I just I really like drinking and sort of was flirting with, especially during the pandemic. Like I was drinking more than I was pre-pandemic, and it was you were, time. You were only a functioning alcoholic. Yeah, to, yeah. I think that that absolutely was what it are, is. Don't even realize it. And it became like during the pandemic. I mean like ripping a cocktail at three o'clock was like, well, I made it. I mean, it just like, it just became such a big part of my life. And that's so um, concerning. (laughs) Oh, totally. Totally. So anyway, quit drinking and then trying to add it back to my life in a way that works is literally exactly like small caps for me like it's like let me put up 50 rules around like what I can do and what I can't do and ultimately came to the realization that I just I really can't trade small I can't control myself (laughs) and it's such an addiction it's such an addiction unlike anything yeah and I think I'm like 90 percent to I really just like can't drink but but the the uh alcoholic i guess in me is sort of like let me just try one more barrier or what you know it's yeah oh i'm i'm right if you ever want to talk about that please we can be (laughs) each other's support group i mean it it's hard it is hard especially when it's such a a normal part of culture yep yep and yeah and it's so normalized and like Mm -hmm. going into a meeting at 10 30 on a Wednesday and being like oh I'm so hungover is just sort of accepted and like I don't know that's I have, why I gave it up because I just couldn't I couldn't deal with the next morning I was like this is miserable I don't want to yep. do this anymore yeah it is miserable I have I now extremely strict guidelines on like I will never have a drink prior to a trading day and like you know oh, I've got so all much more disciplined than I am oh I'm I'm huge on it because I don't, if I lose in a trade, I need that to be my loss at like my best. I cannot, I can't have it be like, oh, I took someone's calls or I was hung over or what there, it has to just be like, it's gotta be me. I have to have me to blame or I can't do it. Yeah, I get that. I mean, I, that's the nice thing about I mean, well, it's also, it's also the not nice thing about crypto that it's 24 seven because, because I have made some very risky trades when I have been not the most sober. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think trading under the influence, it's a thing. thing. Can I tell you my favorite small cap story? Yes, please. Only, wait, is that, is that your kid? It is, but she's very used to the situation. (laughs) <laughs> hold on one hold on one second julia yeah. you can cut this out what do you want me to drop it in? So, i i want you to make a paper airplane then write ben with me oh okay sure i can do that because I, um, oh, I promised ben that i would make one okay Bye. okay two paper airplanes okay. with quinn and bennett on it all right i'll bring it out when i'm done okay. all right love you Okay. All right. Tell me. Leave, I think you should leave that in because that was just one of the cutest things I've ever experienced. <laughs> sure, Joel. Leave it in. I mean, we have all we have all kinds of. It's very uh, well known that I'm a mom. I'm a mom. So cute. <laughs> all right. Tell me your small cap story. Okay. It has to do with trading under the influence. Okay. And happy. Oh, I'm gonna love it already. Um. So it was back in the days of when. Oh, uh, the PDUFAs, the dr- the uh, PDUFAs, PDUFAs. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Well, so it was like I was at work. Well, no, I wasn't at work. It was because it was right before market closed, and it was the ticker was ORF. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mind you, my phone still autocorrects some words to small cap tickers. They haunt. Me. Totally. I cannot type the word and 
because it corrects to AMD. AMD. Yeah. Am I am I trading AMD enough that I would use it more than and? ITRM. <laughs> I still get ITRM. I still get TCAT. I still get like Vizzle. Like, don't even get me started. <laughs> S-E-N-S, like I still get sends. I it just doesn't stop. Well, so <laughs> it was like 7:30, and the Padufa, whatever, for Orf was that night. And it was either if it passed, it was going to soar. If it didn't, well, we all know what would happen. Right. Well, so I texted Happy in my infinite wisdom, and I was like, yo, I think I'm gonna hold the bajillion shares I have through the Padufa. Like, we're gonna wake up and be millionaires. I was so drunk and by that I mean I don't drink often so I maybe probably had a glass of wine at dinner and was trashed okay um he was out because he's in college and I also think was not sober or he was just listening to me which I would never do um (laughs) well so we both so confidently convinced each other that we were gonna wake up trillionaires Uh uh-huh because of the padufa yeah I woke up five thousand dollars underwater because it did not pass the Padufa. Okay, well, th- it, this could be worse. I think <sighs> you're going to be like 40 grand. You just told me a $30,000 story. <laughs> yeah, but like this was a decision made in five seconds where I had convinced myself this was going to make my career forever. And I would then be able to retire at 28 years old and live the retirement home life I have always wanted. <laughs> that, um, that was my brain. I mean, I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah, I totally get it. I sometimes when I would be trading small caps and like kind of hung over, I would during the days of um, SPAC and FUBO. SPAC. SPAC. I would just sort of like have a day and then like have Mm -hmm. my drinks at night and then just be like, just be like, well, I'm just going to like. I'll just like full port spat tomorrow because like Zach Morris full says it's like, going. My whole body just started itching. Like I just <laughs> didn't, like, didn't know that. <laughs> like I just got some visceral reaction. <laughs> oh, I don't miss that. Oh, oh so God. it was so bad. Or like um, Fubo. You know, I would be like in Fubo at six. Fubo was the next Enron. Yes. Yes. Fubo was the next Enron. It is the most <laughs> defunct company I have ever researched in my life it is so <laughs> bad uh i didn't even care i was just like i, but I held remember it having fubo. yes i held it from like 60 down to like 30 or something Ooh. and i was like i mean zach says like they're gonna be playing soccer on this thing so i mean oh god i did that just... with viacom i did that with viacom when I, I i don't even remember what the name of it was called but that that I think it was either Japanese, it was some Asian hedge fund got just massacred and he sold like billions of dollars worth of Viacom and the thing just tanked and Archipelagos or something like that. And I convinced myself it was going to go back up to where it was and I bought like $20,000 worth. It did not go back. (laughs) It still hasn't gone back. Uh, The whole way with Fubo, I would like, average down like oh i was just watch atlas and zach would be like good ads here and i was like yeah totally good at i mean just like what the itching has started again what was i doing the itching has started Uh, i remember that i was on the atlas momo floor for approximately two weeks and i remember all of that like it haunts my dreams oh i also one time was supposed to be in a oh god this is so embarrassing it was my child's kindergarten brand new school we were doing a conference and we were in the minivan our minivan coming back from seeing my husband's parents and we pulled over to a mcdonald's to like take (laughs) this zoom call or whatever to introduce the freaking teachers and my husband's like hey can i use your phone and i was like no, because no. <laughs> literally, because PJ Matlock said that, like, if this breaks 650, we're going to eight. Oh and I was like, God. I was like, we're at 630, Jimmy. So, like, the, <laughs> the whole freaking, like. Jimmy, what are you thinking? Yeah, the whole conference. I'm just it together. so checked out. I can't even, like, remotely function on what the teacher's saying because I'm just like, PJ Matlock said. Oh and then God. like it didn't work and then I'm losing money and there I and then we got off the call and Jimmy was like do you did you hear anything they said and I was like no 
Look, <laughs> 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 like, yeah, hope, hope you listened. <laughs> I feel like so many people have stories like this. And it's just like, we find these to be normal stories and they're just so not normal. Yeah, not normal. No, I was- Not um, normal. Oh my God. This is when I realized that I needed to do crypto because it wasn't during the work day. I was doing a, it was a deposition and my computer, my laptop was being used as the shared screen at some point oh, for, no. for exhibits. Oh and, no. Oh <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> my boss is in the room and he was like all right um um we need exhibit it was like exhibit j and I was like fumbling because also simultaneously at the same time it was power hour oh yeah yeah I was I was in the middle of like watching this thing halt up somehow and I didn't I just didn't answer I didn't answer <laughs> and he was like we need exhibit J I was like oh yeah sorry got it and I shared my screen and exhibit J didn't come on and it was just think or swim and he was just like counsel we, we need a couple seconds and they were like oh yeah absolutely take your time and <laughs> it was post-covid everything was virtual so he just muted the conference room. he looked at me and he goes the fuck you doing I was like I'm so sorry <laughs> I'm so sorry. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, ah, you know, losing money, but here's exhibit J. I'm sorry. This will never happen again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Uh, it was awful. And then awful. I, that was not that long ago, actually. It was like right before I left the firm. And then I was like, you can't trade during the day because you have a job. You need to do something that's after hours only. We're going to go to crypto. And that's why I ended up going to crypto because I just like, I couldn't do it during the day because I don't I, have control. I struggle with that so bad. I am meeting with anytime I take a meeting during the day, it's usually podcast related. People want to like, you know, meet with me or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'll do noon thinking that I'll have enough self-control to like (laughs) trade open and be done. And then we'll be like in the call and they'll say something and I won't answer. And then I'll be like, I'm in spy puts. Hold on. Hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Are you on drugs? (laughs) Like Maybe. (laughs) <laughs> Literally, I used to push my meetings back until after market open. And then I realized that since courts open at nine, like that's just not feasible. <laughs> we'll be like we want to meet with you at 830 before court. I'm like, um, how about like 1015? And they're like, no, like that just doesn't work for us. I'm like, but it works for me and it like, the stock market and like the NASDAQ and all those things. <laughs> like, no. You're like, I'm trading pre-market right now. And then oh, like, the, I got to get in my, I got to get in a halt. God, I would there's... run into the office. So I would make sure I was up there in my debt at my desk by nine o'clock because I'm notoriously late for almost everything unless it's court. And so I would sometimes be strolling in at nine 15. God forbid somebody talked to me before nine 30 and I would yeah. try to get off. I'd be like, you cannot talk to me until 10 o'clock. Yeah. And they're like, well, then maybe you should get here on time. And I'm like, maybe you should get here on time <laughs> <laughs> as they've been there on time. I like to this day, my daughter gets dropped off at nine. And also I, I'm, I'm like looking at charts or like, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. I can't get her there quite like right at nine. So we leave the house at like nine Oh five. It's two minutes away. So yep. like wheel in at nine Oh seven <laughs> takes about 10 minutes to get her dropped off. And then I'm like coming back literally like on the phone with my friends who I trade with. And I'm like, I'm going to make it. I mean, this is every morning. Am I, am I at open call? Calm, cool, and collected. No. no, I like like barely making there, making it. The just fun. like I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> but that's that's the fun of it, right? Like that's why we do this, right? <laughs> totally, totally. Right. I mean, it, there is some uh, dopamine hit thing that is just magic in the stock market that I love. I like, I just I I have never done hard drugs. But I okay. can imagine this is what people say when they're like, I took a hit and like, I have to keep doing more. I'm like, I don't do drugs, but I do trade stocks. So like, I get it. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, same, same, same. I don't, um, I've, I'm not a uh, hard drug user, nor have I ever been, but like the bell goes off and I'm just like <gasps> salivating. It's like, this is what a line of coke must feel like. Yes. yes. <laughs> like, I don't know it, but I think this is probably yes. what it feels like. Yes. And then I like could 
not be more we're alert? Sick. We're <laughs> sick. We realize that, right? Like, this is a normal thing. I know. I know. It's so bad. It's so bad. And I love it so I can't much. look at things like I can't look. So part of my old job, because it was it was medical, was looking at fetal heart rates and like fetal heart monitors and things like that. And they just look like fucking line graphs to me. <laughs> like, and you're like, we're about to break out. <laughs> and she's like, do you see the abnormal pattern? I'm like, I see a head and shoulders. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, I, that, I, that, like, that's just not normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally it's just not normal totally oh totally do you dream about trading um no i actually have very strange dreams that i remember vividly the next day and i like they scare me like i'm a very vivid dreamer it's in their weirdest shit like uh, i can't even get into them i don't dream i don't dream about trading okay well i'll leave you to that i do a lot of like beautiful <laughs> bar charts in my dreams like i just dream about trading. Well, they say that you dream about what you go to sleep thinking about last and like uh -huh. i don't for myself that, I, that better not be true because if that's the case i'm dreaming of like being on mars in a bus made out of like some sort of fuzzy material and last night i had to get to the end of the pool because there was a pineapple but then if i didn't i would be expelled like oh, none of that makes wow. sense wow yeah no. it was really bizarre um, so I'm on a manifesting journey that uh, right. I started probably seven weeks ago, a very strict manifesting routine. Mm -hmm. But so I do this manifest manifestation as I go to sleep. And obviously what I'm trying to manifest is just like a badass trading career. So like, of course, if, if that's true, of course, I'm thinking about trading all night, which yeah. is fine. You're going to make I, it. I mean, I, mean, I hope so. <laughs> What do they say? Wag me? Wag me? We're all going to make it? Yeah. Except I just learned in a podcast two nights ago that 80% of traders fail within their first year. Definitely. People run out of money. So I'm now like honestly getting a little ego of like, well... <laughs> <It's just laughs> didn't, yet market. didn't fail my first year. So then it goes on to 90% of traders fail. So I'm like, all right, that's so it. that's only like 10% left that I have to beat. We are the make top 10% of the world. I mean. I mean, we're not, but I'm going to keep telling myself that. Uh, <laughs> that was a joke. I don't, I'm not that egotistical. I do uh, think, can I touch on that? I think, I think most traders fail because by the time they learn to trade, they've run out of money. Okay. How That's do you cool. not work the rest of your life making enough money to put back in the stock market to like, uh, like uh, that gambling addiction part of me, I don't think that I have under control yet. Oh, I definitely don't. But how does one lose their money and then be like, I was defeated? Because um, I, don't I, I don't have that in me. Like this will either break me or I will make it. I, I don't know. I've never... I haven't quit anything ever. Like I just haven't. So I, I, I can't touch on that. I don't know how they could do it. That's yeah, probably I, when they go and pay a Patreon to teach them. I'm also not a quitter. Oh, well. Um, yeah. <laughs> actually, I did quit one. I did. Mm, I just lied to you. That was my first ever podcast lie. Uh-oh. I quit my job at Abercrombie when I was in high school. Oh, well, job. Sure. I quit my job scooping ice cream in high school. OK, I mean, well, then then, yeah, then. But that exactly wasn't my passion. Then. I've never quit a passion. Oh, you think Abercrombie was mine? <laughs> <laughs> At one point, though, it was. But sure. It well, it smells delicious point. in there. I can smell that shit from miles away. It's in my blood. Yeah. Yeah. They and once right. once you go in, it's on you forever. It's very different, though. I was in there recently. It's very different than it used to be. I, I wish that. I wish that Abercrombie would have like a resurgence, like a beautiful. Oh, they're working on it. Oh, OK. I'm not even joking. Okay. I, like recently bought a pair of Abercrombie jeans, which I would not be caught dead doing unless it was high school and I worked uh -huh. there. But like they've gotten rid of putting their logos on everything. Like they're oh. changing the game. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Yeah. Go like if. Like, if I could just live my life in, like, Abercrombie jeans and a flannel and, like, um, a crew neck sweater, I okay, think I go could there. be They're so, soft. so happy. Do it. <laughs> okay. All right. Do I'm going to go tomorrow. Well, yeah. It's going to require going to the mall, but. 
they no longer have the scary people at the front that have to say hi to you. Oh. Yeet. I was one of those people. Perhaps I will do some Abercrombie online shopping later tonight. Probably the better answer. Yeah, I don't know. where we talk about clothing. Sure. Sure. I'd love to. I don't talk about it on Twitter, but like, I am such a fashion geek. I, I, yes. Okay. I'm definitely into that. Amazing. Oh, I can't wait to nerd out about that. All right. Well, on that note, uh, we have reached the end of our time together and it has flown by. Wait, that's I need sad. like, I need like many more hours with you. That's sad. This means we have to be real friends though, because clearly we just like get along. I know. I feel like I've gotten a new best friend. Like I, maybe I was like, we were slightly... already friends, but like now, now we're, but now friends. you know me, right? Oh, I know you, you know me. So, and you know me. Yeah. You know my yeah. Real name. I mean, now we're in it. So yeah. is what it is. <laughs> oh my God. I, for what it's worth, I thought for the longest time, your first name was Penny. A lot of people do and it's okay. And then I realized that, oh, Penny Lane, because Penny stocks, duh. Yeah. It just like, I, took me an entire year to figure that out. Yeah. I didn't really, I didn't, I don't know if I made that clear enough, but. It should be pretty self-explanatory. Well, even if you don't get the Penny stock reference, I really like the, so I'm like a huge, huge music fan. And I kind of liked the Penny Lane, like music groupie reference is like a stock groupie kind of. I dig it. In my like hippie fantasy life. I, you know, I had a, (laughs) I had a whole thing I was working on that was maybe over people's heads, but. I dig it. It's it, we're here now. <laughs> I think you've made it. I mean, I might, I'm going to start saying that just yeah. I've made it. I've and made then it. I have a great financial podcast and I'm a trader. And There's I'm a, I, yeah, I'm a trader. And then, and you then are. very soon I'm going to just, uh, reinvest those profits into, I'm a great trader. There you like, go. Like badass. And yeah. then no you know. one's going to tell you differently and no one's going to believe you unless you believe you. And I'm going to leave it at that. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your time. This was just, just magical. Whenever you want to (laughs) chat, even if it's about something that isn't stock related and you want to do like an off topic podcast, I am yours. Perfect. I love, I mean, this was, this was only maybe 20% on topic. So Uh, yeah, I'm really sorry to all the listeners that came here wanting stock advice. Um, Yeah. Uh, but you know what? My podcast, so <laughs> I'm not that sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, it was just delightful. My Adderall's run off by now, so that's that's not helping. Eh, I mean, I, I've talked about stocks enough. I needed a little break. <laughs> People should know by now that if they're going to listen to something with me on it, it's never going to be on topic the whole time. <laughs> it's just not. Like, that's not my brand. That's not my brain. Sorry. Well, I... Totally, totally here for it. All right. Well, I will. I'll see you next time. Yeah, soon. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that the Penny Lane podcast makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional or financial advice. Unless specifically stated otherwise, the Penny Lane podcast does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast. And information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement. The third-party materials or content of any third-party site referenced in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions, standards, or policies of the Penny Lane podcast. The Penny Lane podcast assumes no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or completeness of the content contained in third-party materials or on third-party sites referenced in this podcast or the compliance with applicable laws of such materials and or links referenced herein.